Hi guys, in this video I want to focus on measures of central tendency when dealing with univariate numerical data. So the basic idea here is that we want to study, study where the center, or we want to find, locate the center of the data. So you could think of this as uh, when summarizing data it's very common to want to report a single value that represents all of the observations. So instead of just presenting all your data to someone, you want to give them a single value that kind of captures all of the data. So naturally, we gravitate towards the center, where we, well, at least trying to locate where the center is. It turns out that there's a few ways to measure the center. Okay, so we call these measures of central tendency. I want to talk about the two most important ones here, and I want to differentiate them and tell you when the one is better to use than the other and um, sometimes when you want to might, might want to look at both okay so we're going to start with our, uh, the, the most important measure of central tendency the mean so the mean is just the arithmetic average of a bunch of numbers here's the formula for it okay so all we're, we're doing here is it, we're summing up a whole bunch of numbers actually specifically n numbers and in stats if you're looking at this and you're taking a stats course n is the sample size so that's just how many observations you have how many data points you have okay so we're summing all n of these observations up and then we're dividing by n so that's just how you've taken averages since grade school okay in stats we use x bar, y bar, or something, some Roman character bar as uh, the symbol for the sample mean. Okay? So that's all that is. All right? So this formula shouldn't look anything unusual to you. I want to focus mo more on the subtle points. So what does the mean do? So I got three bullets here that really kind of are going to help us differentiate between the mean and the median as far as measures of central tendency. Notice in this formula, that every single observation works its way through this formula. Nothing is excluded. So think about what happens. If you have a very large value, unusually large, let's call it ex an extremely large value, an outlier, or on the other end, an unusually small value. And when I say unusually, I mean compared to the rest of the data. This is going to have a big impact on the, on the value of the mean, okay? So the mean is affected by extreme values or outliers, okay? So that's something to, to keep in mind to differentiate with the next measure of central tendency we're going to talk about. And another point to keep in mind is that the mean, at least in the, in the physical interpretation, is the center of gravity of the data. It's almost like if you were to plot out all your points with a dot, piling them up when you have multiple uh, uh, values at a certain uh, value, uh, certain uh, uh, repeated observations at a certain value, the mean would be the point at which this line would balance and not tip this way or this way, okay? The center of gravity, all right? That's the, the one-dimensional interpretation of it since we're dealing with univariate data, all right? Also keep that in mind as we now move on to the median. The median, uh, although it doesn't have as universally an accepted symbol as the mean, we usually use Q2 to indicate the second quartile. The median and the second quartile are synonymous. What is the median? Well, notice there's no formula here. It's more of an algorithm, okay? So basically what the median is, it's also another way to measure the central tendency of a set of data or a sample of data. And, but what the median does, quite differently than the mean, is it gets the middle value once the data is sorted. So 50% of your data is gonna be to the left of the median, and 50% of your data is gonna be to the right. That doesn't mean that the range on this side is gonna equal the range on this side. It just means that 50% of the observations are going to be here and 50% of the observations are going to be here. Quite different than the center of gravity, which is what the mean is. 
okay? So it divides the data into two equal sized parts, 50% on above, 50% below. And think about, let's talk about how you get the median. Well, you take all your data and you sort it first. You can sort ascending or you can sort descending. It doesn't matter. Once it's all sorted, you pick out the middle number, okay? So what happens if n is odd? So let's say n is 5. So you have five observations. Well, the middle number is going to be clearly the middle number. It's going to be the third once you put them in order. But what if n is 6, an even number? So you have six observations. You have six data points, six values. You're not going to have a single middle number once you sort the data. You're going to have two middle numbers. So the way we resolve that is that we find the two middle numbers once the data is sorted. So in this case, this will be the third in order and the fourth in order, right? And we average those two numbers. That's the median. Both these, whether you have an n of that's odd or even, will give you a value q2, the median, that split that actually holds to this definition, splitting the data up into two equal size points. Now let's also think about one more subtle point before we end this discussion. The median, notice, doesn't care what the biggest number or the smallest number is. Okay? The biggest number, if you were to change the largest number in your data set to from like a hundred to a billion, it would still be the largest number and it would have no impact on the middle number, i.e. the median. Likewise, if you were to change the smallest value in your data set, let's say it was 53, and you were to change it to 0.53, it would have zero impact on the value of the median, the middle number. Because unlike the mean, the median doesn't take into account all the values, just the middle value once your data is sorted. So we say that the median is resilient to extreme values as opposed to the mean, which was highly affected by extreme values. OK, so which one is better? Well, um, from, uh, in my opinion and many statisticians opinions, we would say that the mean is always the preferable choice. However, it is inappropriate to use the mean as a measure of central tendency when you have highly skewed data, whether it is left skewed or right skewed. Why? Because in those instances, you have a lot of extreme values on one end or the other end of the, uh, of, the of the distribution. And therefore, the mean would get pulled towards those. Let me actually illustrate this. So if we have a right skewed or positively skewed distribution, the mean of this distribution of this these values would get pulled away from where you would think the center would be around where I'm hovering my mouse to a little bit to the right because these values up here although infrequent are so large sometimes that they're pulling the mean up by the way the, I'm using mu as the kind of population mean and you could use x bar if you like okay don't get too caught up with the symbols at this point, unless you're taking a stats class, in which case you should definitely know the difference between mu and x bar. Sample mean, population mean, okay? And likewise, if we had a negatively skewed distribution, so we have uh, most of our data on the high end of the range and a few values on the low end of the range, but uh, quite far down there on the low end, the mean would get pulled towards that tail, okay? Just like the, as the formula uh, we showed in the formula, a big number or a really small number will pull the mean towards itself. Whereas the median in these two extreme instances of skewness would be unaffected by values in these extremities, in these tails. So the median would stay put somewhere closer to where you would actually visually imagine the center to be somewhere around uh, where where there's this concentration of data so what's the moral here if you know that you have a highly skewed distribution the mean is not a good measure of central tendency but the median is why is the mean still preferred if 
you don't have these kind of extreme instances because the mean in, ma in mathematical terms is much more tractable. It's much easier to work with in mathematical operations than the median is. That's, that's one argument for uh, mean being slightly preferable to the median, except in obvious circumstances like the pictures that I've drawn here. So whenever you see something like the mean income or mean real estate price of a certain uh, neighborhood, be very wary uh, if that is actually a, a good representation of where most of the data is. Because if it's a highly skewed distribution like income, for example, tends to be, uh, it tends to be like a right skewed distribution in most societies around the world, then the median would paint a much rosier picture about in income parity than uh, is actually the case. The median would be much more preferable or much more accurate way to measure the center, a representation of what, what typical values are in those cases. Otherwise, if you have somewhat symmetric distributions like uh, bell-shaped distributions or triangular distributions or rectangular distributions, the mean is a much more um, preferred in the median and it's not necessary. Oftentimes it's good to uh, plot a histogram, see what you're working with, and then choose your numerical summaries accordingly. Uh, if you don't have an extreme uh, skewness, you can quote both the mean and the median as, as two separate measures of central tendency. Okay, um, so this is something you all learn in an introductory stat course. I thought it's a good idea to differentiate these two big uh, measures of central tendency so you can uh, see the subtle points between them and differentiate them. Hope this was helpful. Be sure to subscribe to Jaleer Academy, comment, share. Until next time, have a great day.